Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. A quick PSA before we get started on our main topic, just wanted to touch base on Log4j. CISA issued an emergency directive and basically said all of their agencies needed to update their code and anything that is using Log4j by 5 p.m. EST on December 28th. So this is mainly just to say that Log4j is not going away. It is something that is going to be around for a while and it is pretty bad. Uh, Kenna Security, which is a company that does vulnerability risk scoring, scored this CVE at an 87 out of 100, which out of 165,000 other CVEs, only 0.04% have ever scored that high. So it is essentially riskier than 99.6% of all known vulnerabilities. And then we're also seeing the exploitations increase exponentially each day so just looking back at the number of exploitations in the wild starting last week saturday there were only 46 then sunday went to like 169 monday 767 and by thursday it is now up to 28,313 exploitations we're recording this on a monday and i'm sure you know, we're probably up into like the 50,000s by now. So again, we're seeing it a lot more in the wild. There's been some reports that nation states are using Log4j exploitations. There's also a report of a first wormable um, Trojan that has used, that is using the Log4j vulnerability. The most current version of Log4j is now 2.0. One seven. So initially when we recorded our podcast last week, we were at 2.15. Shortly after that, there was another update to 2.16. Now we are up to 2.17. So it's continuously getting updated. And that's just a result of more people now looking at the code base and finding more vulnerabilities and fixing it. And that's a good thing because not many people were looking at it before, but now they are. So I would expect more patches. So you know, kudos to the security defenders that are out there. You guys are working hard trying to keep your company safe. On to our main topic today, we wanted to revisit work-life balance. About a year ago, a little over a year now, we did a work from home tips and tricks uh, podcast episode. And if you haven't gotten a chance to listen to that, that's a great episode to listen to. We have a bunch of tips and tricks. And if not, this one here, we'll talk about a few more. With 2021 coming to an end now and the pandemic not really slowing down and not seeing an end in sight, a lot of people are still working virtually. Or they're kind of mixing some days in the office now and and, and working from home. But people are pretty exhausted from overflowing inboxes, nonstop notifications, back-to-back meetings. There was an article that I read this week that got me thinking about mental health and work-life balance. And it was written by the head of Microsoft's People Analytics and the team that looks into productivity trends around the world. And what they found was weekly time spent in Teams meetings over the last year and a half has more than doubled. And that the average person sends 42% more chats after hours during the pandemic than they did pre-pandemic. Over that time, employee satisfaction has dropped 13%. And so they were doing a study to try to find out from the data, a bunch of different questions and how to interpret the data that they're seeing. 
So one of the things that they noticed was as collaboration time increased, well-being and job satisfaction decreased. So employees who spent more time collaborating, attending meetings, writing emails, sending chats, rated lower satisfaction with work-life balance than colleagues who spent fewer hours collaborating. Employees who were satisfied with work-life balance attended less meetings. They spent less time collaborating, and they spent less time in general sending emails and after-hour emails. And that seems pretty basic, but overall I think there's a lesson to be learned here in that you know, as we go down and talk about this, there's going to be some things that we say, hey, this is going to help drive more satisfaction. Some other things as well, focus time, which is kind of a Microsoft term, but it's just basically time that you can book for yourself that is uninterrupted. Think about, you know, if you have a meeting and another meeting, or maybe you only have five minutes, but you also have work that needs to be done. And so if you're constantly in meetings or you're constantly getting interrupted to do certain tasks, you never actually get time to focus and work on the things that you need done. And so focus time is important. The employees who had more focus time were more satisfied with work-life balance than the folks who didn't have focus time. And then of course, the vacation as well. So in the study, Microsoft employees actually had 83% less vacation time booked during the pandemic. They saw a huge drop and that also contributed to less job satisfaction. So basically what they found from the study was less meetings, more uninterrupted focus time and more time off to recharge. Right. And so I think the important question is those are pretty obvious things to do, but how do you get there and try to drive towards that as a goal? For me, I think there's definitely a shift in both my mentality as well as a culture shift in the company. And it can be driven from the top. I think part of it is empowering the employee to know what their boundaries are, but as well as if you're a people manager, you have to be conscious of your employees' mental health and their well-being. Every one-on-one that I have with my current manager, the question always comes up, hey, what are you doing to recharge? What are you doing to take time off? Have you taken any time off? Are you planning on taking any time off? You know, make sure you're not getting burnt out. That constantly comes up every single time. And it tells me that my manager cares about my mental health. So if you're a people manager, I think that is super important to do. I always appreciated when I had a manager who asked those things, but, and this is a big but here, it's really easy to tell when it's not genuine. It is a test of how genuine a manager is, because if that's a message you can deliver and as an individual contributor or as one of your reports, I I genuinely believe that that's what you want me to do. And I love hearing that. I love that interest in maintaining a healthy balance of of work and, and life outside of work. But if it comes up like you're telling people to go burn vacation so they don't lose it before the end of the year, like the time to have that discussion was in July, not in December, right? If If you're having that discussion at that point, what that tells me is your fingers weren't on the pulse and you didn't understand where your employee's time away status was. And now you're trying to make up for it after the fact, which like anything we do in work or in life, there's a time to do it where it's proactive and helpful. And then a time where it's reactive and less helpful. And that's kind of the latter. So um, I think there's great advice here on that. And it's kind of one of those obvious things, but make sure that's a year long process, an ongoing process and not something that's solely focused on like use it or lose it time or anything like that, because that comes off as much less genuine. 
and the opportunity to do something that's really impactful. Time off is much more helpful if you get it all year round rather than all at once. Another thing managers can do that is helpful is to help your team and your direct reports prioritize their work. We understand that you're not going to get it all done. There's just too much to do and you're constantly getting piled on. And so one of the most important things a manager can do is say, what's the most important thing that you guys need to do? And what are the things that can get dropped? You can't always say, you know, I need you to do this and this and this. Sometimes you need to say, I need you to do this or this. So if you're giving that message to your team, it empowers them as well to speak up and say no to things that aren't mission critical. One of the things that, again, my manager has done for me is as these meetings have come up, we've kind of done a review of which meetings are important and which ones are not. And as I tell him, Hey, I'm super busy. I'm booked with all these meetings. Like, well, what meetings are you attending? And turns out there's a few that aren't as important. And he said, you know, go ahead and decline those, you know, feel empowered to decline them and free up your time to do other things that are more important. And so again, same thing, the message comes from the top and if you're conveying that message, the employees will probably have a better sense and satisfaction of their job. Two, two notes on this prioritization conversation. Number one, this is a, prioritization especially is a two-way street. I saw a really good tweet, and I wish I had captured who wrote it, but it was really phenomenal in the sense that it said, here's how you as an individual contributor can help with any prioritization challenges. When your manager assigns new work to you, you say, hey, boss, this work is going to take, just so you know, about six to 10 hours of focus time to complete. I currently have my top priority as this. Do you want this to supersede that as my top priority? Do you want me to accomplish the second, third, fourth, fifth? Have that conversation right then and there up front as new work comes in on prioritization. So you understand where that's at, but also so your manager who just might not have line of sight to your current tasks and your current workload gets that line of sight. It's a two-way street. If you don't educate your manager on why you're busy and what you're doing, how do you expect them to be able to make all those informed decisions? So that's one thing. The other thing, and and, you know, I, I do want to throw a little caveat in here as well. This entire show is not to say Microsoft's got everything figured out from a culture, work-life balance perspective. I'll be honest. Uh, pre-pandemic, uh, pretty much best job I've ever had. Just just couldn't find a bad thing to say about it. Pandemic life's been tough on everyone, and even at Microsoft. And what I liked when I when Andy said, hey, let's do a show on this this week, is I personally have kind of gone through this self-awakening process of what makes sense in this perpetual work from home pandemic lifestyle that is different than before, because it requires different choices that I used to not make that now I have to make to protect my mental and physical well being. Um, and they're different than before. So just want to point that out. This is not us saying we've got all the answers. This is us saying, here's what's worked for us. And here's what hasn't. And take that for what it's worth. You know, we're just two guys sharing an opinion. But one thing our our employer does do a heck of a lot of is a lot of research on what makes people empowered, what makes people productive, because that ultimately is our mission at Microsoft. So that's worth saying too. So on that note on empowerment, specific to meetings, this is super helpful. I love when my managers say, you're empowered to not attend meetings that don't make sense to you. And in fact... This should be culture up and down any company. If your company has a culture that is cool with people sitting in meetings where they're not bringing value and they're wasting time, then your company likes to waste money. I remember I visited a customer once, and and I won't name names, but one of the coolest things I saw at their campus was outside of every conference room was a placard that said, this conference room seats, and we'll just make up numbers, seats eight people. 
given the average salary of employees at Corporation X, a cost of a one hour meeting is Y dollars. And it was a staggering amount of money to just fill that room for one hour is money that's potentially being wasted that could be spent on other endeavors. So I know people have been talking about meetings and meeting culture since the beginning of time, but it's as important as ever to make sure that you're filling your time in the most effective manner possible. It's never a bad time to get, get really sharp on that. It's interesting to hear you say that life is different pre pandemic and post pandemic at Microsoft, because just like you, I had worked from home when I worked at Microsoft previously. And then, you know, I worked from home when I was at my other employer when the pandemic first started up and now I'm working from home from Microsoft again. And I think as I'm thinking about it now, when you said that the difference is that the pandemic affected everyone and that we can't go anywhere else. Like before we were working from home, but we had other outlets where we could like go and do stuff and, you know, life was more open and I think everyone was just happier, but now you know, with the lockdown and everything else, just your outlets are different. And so um, that has affected, I think, just everything in general. So I do agree with you there and, and um, that, you know, the pandemic has affected everyone. Even if you are a seasoned work from home, you know, employee, which, you know, you've been working from home for years now, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it is different with the pandemic. So there are things that you should consciously do to, try to protect your mental health. And that's why we're talking about this. I'll just be honest. Work from home was a lot cooler when not everybody else was working from home. <laughs> uh, not, not so much in the sense that I was getting over on everyone, but in the sense that when everyone is not traveling, not on airplanes, not driving in cars, not really doing anything, but sitting and banging out emails and sitting in meetings, it, it there's this natural inclination to create more busy work. There's just more, inspection, more people asking questions, more people saying, Hey, well, I'm kind of bored today. So I'm going to go bother so-and-so about this, you know? And, um, when all those people were busy traveling on airplanes, driving cars, whatever, um, there was less time for kind of more, the more menial work, I think. And that's part of what I see is built up from work from home is because you don't have those other endeavors that kind of consumed people's time, it now gets, gets rolled up into, you know, in enhanced inspection, enhanced expectations of productivity, and also just a lack of other, other activities at work, you know, and a lot of workplaces are trying to do kind of like, Oh, virtual happy hours or virtual this or virtual that. I don't, I don't do any of those because they, they don't remotely replace the real thing. And so I find them just a, kind of a waste of time and maybe other people agree with me, but then what do I do is I sit there and bang out more emails and sit in more, you know, meetings and, and then probably create more work downstream. And so it becomes this kind of snowball effect where all of us is, we're not standing around the water cooler, not doing um, other activities in our offices, like having a retirement party for Sharon or, or whatever we used to do in the office um, that consumed time. You know, now there's just more meetings, more emails. And I think that's why everyone feels this, this overload is just because a lot of those other kind of social secondary tertiary activities at work aren't happening right now. And I think that's part of the problem too. And I don't know if virtual engagements of those is, is the way to solve it. It's just honestly getting people to step back and say, you didn't work 40 hours a week in the office anyway. I mean, I know when I did go in the office, we used to walk over to the convenience store like a block away and grab a tea or something, you know, grab a coffee, just, just to get out, just to go for a walk. And it was healthy because we kind of bounced ideas off of each other and did kind of this collaboration walk and talk kind of thing out of an Aaron Sorkin movie. Um, or, you know, you'd go, you go to an activity where, Hey, today in the cafeteria, we're having um, an event for this or that. And just all those little things add up. They really do. And they're not happening right now. So I think that's part of it as well. Yeah. As we're talking about meetings, we had talked about this tip in our work from home tips and tricks episode, but you can schedule by default in outlook 
25 minute meetings for a 30 minute block or a 50 minute meeting for an hour block. And that builds in a natural break. I know I like to do that, especially for internal meetings. Um, you know, Adam and I talk to customers where I think it's more accepted to book on the hour and end on the hour. But even for those, if there's nothing to talk about, you don't necessarily need to fill the time. I know it's not a good sales tactic to like leave a meeting early, but at the same time, again, mental health is important for everybody. And if, the, if you're done with the conversation and there are no more questions and, and you've had a good presentation, yeah, give some time back to everybody, right? Or for internal meetings, I do like to book, you know, maybe a meeting at 2.10 p.m. that goes to, you know, 2.30. It's a 20-minute meeting, Right. Because maybe that person had a meeting that ends right at 2 p.m. And I'm going to just give him a 10-minute break before we start ours. So you can also set this as a company-wide default in exchange if you're not aware. You could do that as default. And, of course, like individual users can go back and change their own settings if they want to do that, something like that. But um, Or you could do you know your own settings. But I think it's important to build in breaks. The other thing that... Uh, I try to do is avoid book ending the week. So try not to book meetings first thing Monday morning. Try not to book any meetings Friday afternoon. That way it gives you some time to prep for the week right at the beginning of the week and then gives you some time to finish up some focus time to get ready and, and decompress for the weekend. If you have meetings first thing in the morning on a Monday that kind of forces you to work and prepare over the weekend, which again, that bites into your off time. So try not to bookend the week. And then, you know, another thing that they talked about in the article was to press pause. So if you, they, if they found that in larger meetings, longer meetings, people tend to multitask a lot more. So step back and evaluate the effectiveness of your meetings. Are you the owner of a meeting with low engagement or a lot of multitasking? I know at my previous company, there was a meeting that I had set up between me and my coworker, Nate, where we would meet with a bunch of folks to talk about, you know, the different things that initiatives that we were doing for information security. And we noticed that over time, less and less people came and were less engaged with less questions. So we did think about, canceling it you know i never checked back with him if he ever did but um it was initially very effective but then over time it became less effective so i think you know in the interest of reevaluating the meeting that probably would have been one that i would have canceled so could meetings be shorter less frequent you know who really needs to be there do they need to be reoccurring do they need to be just scheduled as needed and then of course the the f- famous saying that this meeting could have been an email right like does it need to be a meeting at all could you just have messaged back and forth the information sometimes it's better to just get on and and do a call real quick or something like that but sometimes meeting could have been an email so i think just reevaluating meetings in general how effective they are when they are scheduling breaks those are all things that you can do to help protect your mental health One of the differences between Andy's role and my role is that I schedule a ton of meetings in my current role. And so I've done both ways on this Outlook feature where you can either start late or end early for meetings because they're both options there along with doing that little bit of shortening. And I can tell you absolutely positively, and this should be no surprise to anybody listening, the more effective option is start late. And here is why. And early, we'll say, oh, this meeting's done at, you know, we'll say 2.50. So what happens when 2.50 rolls around? Nobody has a meeting booked till 3. We all know that. And we didn't quite get done with what we wanted to talk about. So we just keep going till 3 o'clock. All right. Well, that did a whole heck of a lot of good. So in my opinion, the much more effective tool is start late. However, with start late, because people aren't accustomed to meetings beginning at 2.35 or 2.10, you need to put, and I do this every single time right now, and I should really get one of those tools that can like automatically import text, text strings for you that you use type commonly uh, to say like, 
Note that this meeting starts at 10 minutes past the hour. And of course, I have people in all the time zones, so I can't even say what hour it is. I just say 10 minutes past the hour. Um, but that's really, really has worked out really, really well. As long as I put it in the meeting notes as well as the start time, people tend to respect it. And I, I have used it with customers, internal and external to Microsoft. And the feedback I get is overwhelmingly positive. And as somebody who's in a sales role, what is kind of one of my number one goals when I have customers on a call? I want them to be engaged, right? I want them to listen. I want them to be active listeners and active participants. If somebody is holding their bladder because they had back-to-backs, or if somebody is so mentally fogged because they've had so many back-to-backs, I don't want them on my call. I want them to get a little bit of a break, a little bit of a recharge before they join me, and then hopefully we we have an attentive audience. So when customers get on calls at that start 10 minutes past the hour, and they say, thanks for scheduling it like this. This was great. I was able to grab a cup of coffee and use the restroom and uh, just kind of refresh my mind a little bit and bang out like a quick email or two. This was great. I really appreciate you doing this. And I say, oh, it's featuring Outlook. You know, you can turn it on too. And I get a lot of, I should look at that. Um, it, it takes commitment, like I said, because you got to put that note in every meeting and everything. But I have gotten a ton of positive feedback on it. So I'd strongly consider if you're going to do this, and I think you should, do the start late methodology because that time actually gets respected when we start. But the end time, people will just blow right past. So that's my thought on that. And then as Andy talked about this concept of bookending, so Monday morning meetings, Friday afternoon meetings, avoiding those potentially blocking off your time even. I literally said, hold on, while we're doing the pre-show, pulled up Outlook and blocked both of those because Monday morning meetings are the worst and they do make you prep over the weekend. I've done it. And uh, Friday afternoon meetings, again, same thing. Like Friday really is that time to kind of close the book on the week and allow you to transition into your weekend, your long time off without worrying about work. And so to me, those are two times that are really critical to protect and make sure that I can do really deep focused work at that time to prepare myself for the start of the week or the end of the week. And that's going to make the entire rest of the week more effective by doing that. So I loved that recommendation as well. As managers, you can also encourage focus time. We talked about focus time, you know, in the beginning where it's uninterrupted time, but it's also stuff that you can do like personal time. So as an example, I block off my lunch hour every day, 12 to one. And so I don't take any meetings over that time. Uh, You can also block off other things. Like I also block off time that I have to go and pick up my kids. I can't take any meetings during that time. So that allows you to have less work spilling over into after hours. If you have uninterrupted focus time and you have those mental breaks and you can also use technology to respect quiet hours As an example, I have turned off notifications completely. You can also do it after a certain period of time. Actually, for my phone, I have uh, notifications just for everything in general turn off at 7 p.m. But you can turn off notifications, for example, within Teams. You can actually just have Teams notifications within the app turn off. You can also turn off specific apps uh, within your phone as well. But... As an example, Outlook for me, since the start of the pandemic, I have turned off notifications for Outlook. It doesn't matter where I work. So I don't have the badge number come on to tell me how many emails I have. I don't have it flash on my screen. I literally check Outlook when I'm mentally and ready to respond to email if I need to. But I kind of equate that to like folks who might have grown up in the answering machine era, right? You call somebody up and you left a message on their answering machine could be hours before they check that message and call you back. I think in this day and age, there's just this heavy expectation that you send something and you wait like two minutes. You're like, why haven't they responded yet? You know, it's like with a text message, you send them and like, I know you have your phone on you. Why haven't you responded? I think just having a culture of dialing back that expectation of instant response and having to respond instantly is huge. I remember when, you know, I worked for Doug Turchek, who was on our show. 
And he would often check his email because, you know, he's an executive and he would check his email on the weekend and email me about something. I knew that there was no expectation to reply, but sometimes I would. But what I didn't think about was what it would do to him, you know, having making him check his email once again after he sent something to me. So, you know, there's another really cool feature that you can use called delay send. And so delay send is like you can, you, it, even if you choose to do something on your off hours, you're crafting an email, you can send that during normal business hours. So that's something that you can do so that you're not stressing somebody else out. And then just as a team, you can just set those expectations. Like if somebody's on vacation, you know, don't message them. Make sure that you're not pinging them. Obviously, there's, you know, sometimes it's an emergency. And if you're in a type of role where you're one man deep and that's the only, you know, you're the only person who is in charge of something, you know, that comes up. But your manager can also, you know, help cover. You have, you know, maybe a buddy system to help cover a system or a particular product, you know, train them up as much as possible. And if it's not an emergency, you know, like the house isn't burning down and, you're not under attack, that sort of stuff, it can wait, right? It can wait a a week. I think that's the most important thing is asking yourself, does this need to be resolved right now? Do I need to bother that person right now? Or can it wait till they get back? And oftentimes it can wait. So Andy, we were talking in the pre-show about everything we had on the agenda for this discussion And I mentioned to you on the pre-show that I'd evolved how I handled a lot of this from how I used to handle it. And I used to be the kind of person that I loved having email on my phone because it helped me triage messages. I could respond to the simple stuff right then and there. And then it wasn't waiting for me when I got back to my computer. I saw it as more efficient because if you pull out your phone at the auto shop or, you know, you're getting your oil changed or you're waiting for an airplane or whatever, whatever you're doing, you know, it was an opportunity to just like bang out a quick message or two and stay, stay a little more up to date on it. But what I discovered is a, as, as my role has changed over time, most of my responses need to be more thoughtful and deep, which was not conducive to mobile email, but also I just, I I would get so so wound around the axle on things like things would come up that would bother me or irritate me. And then I'd be like, hold on, you know, go down to my computer and march down there and, you know, furiously bang on the keyboard and type out a manifesto and telling somebody why they're wrong. And it's just like, this is my time. And it's been, I'm allowing somebody at work to interrupt it, which in the old days of like working in an office, you know, once you drive home, like you don't give people that access to you. So why are we doing it now? And so I really evolved to the point where I'm with you. I turned off notifications for Outlook entirely. I haven't removed it from my phone yet, but I'm debating that step completely. But I didn't completely turn off notifications. No badge numbers, no anything. And I don't think to look at email all day. Like my natural inclination is like, oh, let's pull up Outlook and look at all my work email. Like I find myself, I only check it like once or twice a day on my phone, if at all. And it's much less bothersome that way. And for the most part, I can, I'm can i just better at like, I don't want to look at work email right now. So I don't, you know, it's night, it's a weekend, whatever. And um, so much happier for it. And same with Teams, turn off Teams notifications. Like there's the quiet hours feature in the app. I just turned it off entirely. Like I used to do the quiet hours at least. And I went further now and I'm just like, I'm done letting this ping me on my phone. I just don't like it. And Oh my gosh, like I know this sounds so like old school, but it's so nice to go sit down at your desk at eight, you know, work till five or whenever you work, and then you're done till the next day. Like it'll be there when you get back. And it has been such a breath of fresh air for me that I finally, finally embrace this and and honestly feel really, really good about it. And so I'd encourage anybody, even if you've almost made it part of your persona, which it was for me, like I was really proud to be super responsive and super available. I I, I found that this is so much better. And it, it, even on vacations, you know, we talked about like truly unplugging. I've had multiple examples recently where I've been like, I'm going to go on vacation. And then somebody would ping me 
or send an email to me and they, and they might've just been copying me and they weren't really trying to get me, but because I was still dialed in because it was still seeing everything, I'd get wound back up and be like, Hey, hold on. Don't I, I didn't drop the ball on this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, dude, you're on vacation. You don't need to get worked up. You know, don't, don't worry about it. And so those are just things I think about where you can evolve over time too. You could have done it in a different way in the past, but times are different nowadays and demands are different. And I'd encourage everybody to truly, and I mean truly, reevaluate what makes sense for you and what contributes the best to your happiness and your self-actualization. Because I'd be willing to bet letting people at work interrupt your attention at all times of day and night is probably not one of those things. So I, I like all of this a lot and, and really recommend it at the least use the quiet hours, but if not consider going even further, I, I'm really glad I did. And I never thought I'd be one of those people. I never thought I'd be having this conversation. You know, and of course in information security, I've been, internal IT before and I understand that there are times when you're on call. You're just expected to be on call. I would encourage you to use a different outlet to to raise those critical issues. So for example, email and Teams can be just kind of normal day to day stuff that is not important. And then you can get like a system at my previous company we use something called Pager Duty which can put people on a call schedule. It can integrate with ServiceNow so that if it's a critical issue that it will actually page that person that's on duty. And that was what Doug's guidance was to me as well was, you know, if he's sending me a Teams message, if he's sending me an email over the weekend, that's not something I have to respond to. If it's important, he'll call me. He'll send me a text, right? And so that's different. And so I think that is maybe a, a a culture tip that you can pick up and, and implement at your company is, you know, non-critical things that don't have to be responded to in a timely fashion, teams and email. Great. But if it's pressing, you know, use a system like pager duty that rotates people on call where, you know, you're on a call schedule. And so you can expect it. And maybe you even have a call phone that you can give to somebody so they don't have to worry about that on their personal phone. Um, or, you know, you can just say as a manager, yeah, if it's important, I'm going to just give you a call. Just give me your cell phone number. Right. Then, you know, it's important. Love that. Um, and, and, um, a couple other things you touched on too, that I forgot to just weigh in on delay, delivery, delay, send huge fan of that. And not just because it's helps set boundaries and be respectful of other people's kind of working hours. But again, like you didn't go to all that work of writing that email for people not to see it. And for a lot of our listeners who are in security engineering or security operations, I'd be willing to bet you get a lot of automated emails and I'd be willing to bet a lot of those automated emails come in during the overnight hours. And so I'd be willing to bet if you send an email at eight, nine o'clock at night, it gets buried under a pile of automated alerts that come in in the overnight hours, one, two, three AM. And by you sending that email working at night, you actually just shot yourself in the foot because now people aren't going to see it because it gets buried in that inbox behind all of those alerts or whatever. And it, it just never gets seen. I have learned like the worst time to send an email is anytime after somebody quits for the day and before they come in the next morning, because there's so many scenarios where they looked at it on their phone at night and forgot about it, or it gets buried because a bunch of other stuff comes in. Use delay delivery and have it send to them first thing in the morning. I do this all the time. I will sit down and like, again, this might not be good from a setting boundaries perspective, but it feels good from a, at least like prepping my week perspective. If I sit down again on a weekend, sorry. Um, and I, and I do decide to do a whole bunch of email. I don't send those on Sunday afternoon. I have those all go out Monday morning at 8am local time for different people because I work across a bunch of different time zones. And that definitely helps me know that it's getting seen and at least my time's not completely wasted. And one last note that you also brought up, Andy, uh, from, from a setting boundaries perspective also, and you touched on this, like blocking your lunch or blocking focus time. And I mentioned I went and blocked some of those focus times on Monday morning and Friday afternoon. I too block my lunch and I am very, very, very strong about it. People will try to block my block, 
sorry, book me over my blocked lunch hour. And you don't have to tell anybody it's your lunch. You can mark it as a private appointment. They'll probably figure it out if they see it recurring every day, but whatever, they don't need to know. And you can just say, I'm sorry, I have a prior commitment. You don't have to say, hey, I'm going to take time off for lunch. like Because then people will try, crappy people will try to shame you over that or try to get you to do it anyways. Say, well, can't you just this once? Like, no, no, I can't. That's when my lunch is. And that is another boundary I realized I needed personally was I needed at least some chance in the middle of the day to step away and and go stretch my legs and get some sunshine and some sunlight and visit a different part of my house at least and you know make the commute up the stairs. And it was really, really mentally helpful for, to me. And I don't need to have that conversation with all of my coworkers and team members and everything else. So I just flatly say, I have a prior commitment at that time. I can't make it. And I don't. I don't for anything. And I feel really good about it. And you know what? Ultimately, people will respect your boundaries the more you enforce them. If you're really wishy-washy about them, people will learn that you don't strongly enforce your boundaries and they'll keep asking you to step outside your boundaries. But if you're really firm about them, and you don't have to be a jerk about it. But if you hold firm and you're like, no, I'm sorry, I'm prior commitment, I can't make it. They will learn to stop booking you at times that show as busy on your Outlook calendar. They have the ability to see that. So I um, I, I love all of these ideas. And I encourage people to like really get into calendar management and be really diligent about like blocking all of the things you need that are important to you to be successful in your day. And mark them all as private if you want to. And don't answer to anyone and what they are or what you're doing. Maybe your manager if, if they really inquire, but for the most part, like anybody else doesn't need to know. They just need to know you have a prior commitment and you can't make it. And I encourage people to get really, really firm about that. I think the more we make it culturally normal to be protective of one's own time and, and what enables you to do your best, most focused work, the better off we will all be. Yeah. And then of course, like the final thing is, you know, take time away. If you're a manager, encourage your folks to take time away. Like I said, in my one-on-ones with my current manager every every time every week, you know that comes up. Um, there was one week where he was talking to me and he said, "Hey, like I don't think you've actually taken a lot of time off. I'm worried that you might burn out. I actually, by next week, I want you to book a couple of days off." That was his to do for me. And so, as managers, you can drive this culturally. I know at Microsoft we get um, to use our sick leave as mental health days. That's something that's super helpful as well. Um, they also offered us like five well-being days, which, you know, that uh, that helps uh, everyone recharge and it doesn't cut into your vacation time. But an important thing is, is that you don't necessarily need to go anywhere. I think because of the pandemic, everyone associates vacation and time off with like taking a trip or going on a vacation somewhere but it could just be a staycation, right? You could just take time off and binge some Netflix shows or something like that. That is recharging. Play some video games, you know, go for a walk, do whatever it is that isn't work. Um, So, you know, I was talking to you, Adam, before um, we recorded about a friend of mine, which also kind of prompted this conversation, you know, sounds like his manager is pretty terrible right now where, you know, the expectation is that he needs to be, you know, checking his email um, when he's on vacation. Uh, there's some spots that he likes to vacation in um, in Wisconsin where there's no cell phone signal. So he, he couldn't check email if he wanted to. And the place that they rent doesn't have Wi-Fi. They just they're just off the grid. But his manager was like, well, you better drive to another town and find like a Wi-Fi hotspot in a coffee shop so that you can check your email because, you know, that's the expectation. It's like you're on vacation. And it was like over a weekend, too. You know, it's like a three day vacation. It's not like he's gone for that long. So, you know, what is it in a weekend that is going to be so important? Right. They can't wait till Monday. And so that's, you know, if you're that type of manager, you work for that type of manager, you know try to gently you know change that that culture because that is not healthy um so encourage time away encourage unplugging um 
if I if I took time away, you know, my manager's like, don't check your email, don't look at teams, you know, turn everything off. Um and uh I would actually get yelled at if I sent an email knowingly or sent a message knowingly while I was on vacation, right? And at my previous company too, when I was on vacation, my coworkers were super uh respectful of that. You know, they they would joke because I would send messages in teams every now and then and Nate would joke that, oh, it's this bot, Andy bot, that's like responding automated messages, even though, it was, you know, he was joking that it was a bot that was uh, responding, but it was really me. But yeah, I mean, it wasn't healthy for me to do it, but they also would kind of shame me in a way that, you know, hey, you shouldn't be checking stuff while you're on vacation. So, you know, make sure that when you do take time away to really step away, and that's important. I, I think so much of this conversation just comes down to, reevaluate your boundaries, set those boundaries, enforce those boundaries, and find an organization that will allow you to do that. And I get, you know, switching jobs, you know, regardless of the great resignation or anything else, the, the great reshuffle is still hard. But you do deserve a culture that is supportive of your mental and physical well-being. And please, if, if you're a manager and, and you can do anything about a culture like Andy just described, please do what you can to fix that. Cause that's terrible. And if you're somebody who's employed there, please try to find something better. I promise you it does exist. When Andy told me that story, here's what my reaction was. I said, I get and accept that that really happens, that that is not like a made up story. There are managers like that. I said, I don't know what I've done in life, but I have never had anybody remotely like that ever. And I don't know if it's Midwestern culture or, or if that's like an East coast thing or wherever I haven't run into it around here. And I've been very, very fortunate to never run into it. And I, um, I, I, I just am dumbfounded every single time I hear it. So, you know, ultimately this was, this is a good show you know, talking about different tools that can help things like quiet hours, things like delayed delivery, things like uh, shortened meetings, built in breaks in, in exchange and outlook. Um, but a lot of this too, just is really around you and your manager and having really tight discussions on getting aligned on prioritization. And then again, just having that support system up and down your organization that enables and supports people to do their best work and live their best life and do both of those things at the same time. Yeah. Information security is hard enough as it is just as a normal job. And so, you know, I, both of us encourage everyone listening and, you know, spread the message. We got to protect our mental health so that we don't burn out because it is really, really easy to do. And it's happening all the time in this career field. Mm -hmm. So Thanks for a great conversation and thanks for listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes if you have topics that you want us to talk about or have questions about the show tonight. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.